Welcome to Breaking Down the Basics, Adult IBD. This presentation through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is for the newly diagnosed adult patient with questions about the disease. My name is Kian Kiashin of Stanford University, and over the next 30 minutes, I will go over the basics of inflammatory bowel disease. I have no relevant disclosures. So today's objectives are fivefold. We're going to define inflammatory bowel disease, its potential causes and diagnoses. We're going to discuss management and treatment. We're gonna highlight special populations, particularly focusing on the pregnant patient with inflammatory bowel disease. We're gonna review the role of diet, nutrition, and complementary medicine and therapies in inflammatory bowel disease. And finally, we're gonna introduce some foundational support and resources. So let's first define what inflammatory bowel diseases are. Inflammatory bowel diseases are disorders that cause chronic inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract. The two common forms are Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Symptoms and the course of the disease can vary between individuals. Why do patients get inflammatory bowel disease? I oftentimes tell my patients that we may not be able to differentiate for the individual patient why they got inflammatory bowel disease, but there are several potential factors to consider uh, that studies have shown to be playing a part. The immune system is an important part of this, and there are clearly defined immune system abnormalities that result in uh, inflammatory bowel disease. The immune system usually attacks and kills foreign invaders, such as bacteria, viruses, fungi, and other microorganisms. But in people with inflammatory bowel disease, the immune system mounts an inappropriate response to the intestinal tract, bacteria, resulting in inflammation. Genetics also seems to play a part. The abnormal immune system reaction occurs in people who have inherited genes that make them susceptible to inflammatory bowel disease. There are over 200 genetic locations that are associated with the IBD genetic risk. And children of parents with inflammatory bowel disease are at greater risk than the general population of developing inflammatory bowel disease. Then there are environmental exposures. Though it's still being researched, environmental factors may serve as a trigger to initiate immune responses. And these exposures can include medications, smoking, diet. Finally, the gut microbiota seems to be playing a part. Microorganisms, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, and a few other single-celled organisms are collectively called the microbiota, and they're sometimes referred as, to the, as the microbiome. Many factors play into our gut microbiota, diet, medications, genetics, environment, and in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the microbiota balance is disrupted, and there's abundance of certain bacteria and fungal species. But it remains unclear whether the changes in the microbiome are a result of the inflammation in IBD or whether it's the cause, the disbalance causes IBD. So the chicken and the egg argument is not exactly clear. But those four factors are thought to play a part in development of inflammatory bowel disease. So tackling the two types of inflammatory bowel disease, there are some subtle differences. Crohn's disease has an age of onset between age 15 and 35, and also a second peak around age 55 to 70, and it can involve anywhere from the mouth to the anus. Typically, symptoms depend on the location. So they include abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, fatigue, and invariably, we might see blood in the stools as well. Ulcerative colitis, on the other hand, also has a similar onset, age of 15 to 35, and then again, 55 to 70, but largely involves just the so large intestine. And so here, symptoms can include urgency, fatigue, an increase in bowel movements, mucus in the stools, nocturnal stool bowel movements, and abdominal pain. Bloody stools are commonly a part of the manifestations of ulcerative colitis. There is a process through which patients are diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease. Initially, they might meet with their primary care provider or gastroenterologist who obtains a medical history and completes a physical exam. Then diagnostic testing may be undertaken that includes blood and stool tests radiology scans, endoscopy, colonoscopy, and then a diagnosis of Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis is achieved, or other diagnoses may be entertained. 
Because Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are chronic diseases, patients will go through periods in which the disease flares, is active and causes symptoms. These episodes are followed by times of remission, periods in which symptoms disappear or decrease and good health returns. Recognizing the symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease flares is important so that prompt action can be taken to control the symptoms and alleviate discomfort. The slide here outlines the most common symptoms that we might see in IBD flares. Diarrhea, which is loose or watery stools, a change in bowel movement frequency, an increase in urgent bowel movements and nighttime bowel movements, and rectal bleeding with potential mucus in the stools are hallmarks of flares of IBD. Flares can also be accompanied by abdominal pain or cramping, low-grade fever, and fatigue. It's important to realize that the disease is not always limited to the gastrointestinal tract. It can affect joints, the eyes, the skin, the liver, as we'll investigate in the next slide. And some patients might note a new onset of, for example, joint pain or, ache or mouth ulcers when their disease begins or is flaring. So as far as the, what I mentioned, the extra intestinal manifestations, um, bones are an important piece. And as many as 30 to 60% of patients with IBD can have lower than average bone density. And this is called osteoporosis. It literally means porous bones. Osteopenia, low bone density. Osteomalacia, softening of the bone. And prolonged use of steroids, corticosteroids, active inflammation, vitamin D deficiency may contribute to these conditions. Arthritis can also happen in up to 30% of patients with Crohn's disease or colitis. And this is joint inflammation. And it's the most common site outside of the intestine that might result in symptoms. Arthritis is typically associated with older age, but it can strike younger patients in inflammatory bowel disease. And in addition to pain, patients may have swelling of the joints, reduced flexibility, and typically it improves as the intestinal symptoms also improve. This arthritis can involve the large joints of the arms and legs, can affect the mid and lower spine, and it can also affect, there's a rarer condition called ankylosing spondylitis, which uh, affects between two and 3% of patients in which the uh, lower spine is fused or, or affected. The kidneys uh, can be affected by medications. Um, but once the medications stop, typically kidney function normalizes. And then there are additional kidney complications that include kidney stones and immune-mediated kidney inflammation. In some patients with inflammatory bowel disease, the liver can also become inflamed or damaged. Most of the liver damage is reversible, but serious liver disease can be seen in 5% to 8% of patients with IBD. These complications include fatty liver, hepatitis or inflammation, gallstones, a condition called primary sclerosing cholangitis, commonly referred to as PSC. That's inflammation of the bile ducts, which causes scarring and other liver issues. Mouth sores or canker sores can happen. Approximately 10% of patients with IBD can have eye involvement. And these take on uh, symptoms that include painful eyes, changes in vision, uh, and dry eyes. Finally, the skin can be involved in up to 20% of patients with inflammatory bowel disease and may be due to the disease itself or caused by medications that are used for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. In addition to the extra intestinal manifestations, it's important to understand the complications of ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Complications in Crohn's disease include strictures, intestinal obstruction, abscesses, fistulas, malnutrition, and colorectal cancer. A stricture refers to a narrowing of the intestine. It's a common complication of Crohn's disease. It's frequently responsible for what we call obstructive symptoms, cramping abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite. It usually occurs in the small intestine, but can also occur in the colon. And a stricture is a common indication for surgery. Strictures can result in intestinal obstruction. And so patients may also get markedly bloated, distended, not be able to pass stools or gas, and surgery may be necessary. Medications could sometimes relieve these obstructive episodes, but ultimately uh, a joint management with surgery and medicine will be necessary. Sometimes a perforation or a hole becomes walled off into an abscess or a collection of pus. And abscesses may be responsible for fever, localized abdominal pain, fatigue. Generally, if they're small, they can be treated with antibiotics, but larger collections may require drainage and ultimately surgery. 
the inflammation in the bowel or in an abscess may develop then into a fistula, an abnormal connection between two organs. And fistulas occur from any one organ, such as the bowel through the skin. They can occur to the skin, to the bladder, the vagina, the colon, and symptoms are related to that location. Finally, there's colorectal cancer. Cancer of the colon is more common in patients with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease of the colon. Small bowel cancer is a rare form of cancer. It can be seen in Crohn's disease, but that's unlikely. Good control of inflammation can reduce the risk of both cancers. Moving on from Crohn's disease, there are complications in ulcerative colitis as well. Patients can get anemia from blood loss, dehydration or weight loss, colorectal cancer, and a rare condition called toxic megacolon, which can result in rupture of the gastrointestinal tract, the colon. Anemia, which is the term we use for low red blood cell count, may occur due to blood loss or from low iron. Inflammation interferes with the poor absorption of iron, so that's probably a contributor. Colorectal cancer, as I mentioned previously, in Crohn's disease can occur in five to 8% of patients over 20 to 30 years. The good news is if the inflammation is treated early and heals early, that risk of colorectal cancer really drops to, to minimum. Toxic megacolon is an extremely rare in, uh, condition that results in from inflammation of the colon. Symptoms can include pain, abdominal distension, fever, rapid pulse, dehydration. There's a particular risk of perforation of the bowel when the colon is greatly distended during episodes of toxic megacolon. It is potentially life-threatening. The good news is we're seeing less and less of this condition, and that may have to do with the specific therapies that we're using. So that completes our overview of what inflammatory bowel disease is, what its presentation may be, and some of its complications. Now we're gonna turn our attention a bit to IBD management and treatment. The goals, there are four goals uh, relevant to the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. As a first step, we wanna turn off inflammation, and that's called inducing remission. During this phase, pa pa phase, patients feel well, they have an improved quality of life, labs improve, there's growth, there's development, there's good nutrition. After we induce remission, we want to maintain remission. So keep the disease turned off, optimize therapy, come off corticosteroids, which can result in side effects. We wanna also prevent relapse, a recurrence of symptoms. And potentially by doing this, change the natural course of the disease, heal the lining and reduce complications such as we discussed, the fistulas, the strictures, colon cancer, and so on. Another goal is to monitor disease and prevent complications. So monitoring for early relapse, monitoring therapies, preventing infection, scarring, permanent damage, and thinking about colonoscopy once patients have had disease long enough that we wanna look for colon dysplasia or precancer. Finally, our goal is to improve the quality of life in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, to maintain a job, to go to work, to go to school, socialize, not feel overly upset about the disease. These are all examples of improvement in quality of life. And so really the aims of treatment are to be well and treat the symptoms, but also heal the intestine so that we prevent complications down the line. Because each patient has a different disease course, a comprehensive treatment plan is customized for each patient based on their disease and personal needs. So managing inflammatory bowel disease is a global process that may include over-the-counter prescription, med over the counter medications, prescription medications, surgery, and sometimes complementary and alternative therapies. It is important to realize that what may be appropriate and successful in one patient may not necessarily be the case in another. And so this requires close communication and discussion so that individual treatment pattern, treatment recommendations can be made. So as far as over-the-counter medications, the, these medications treat symptoms. They include antidiarrheals, laxatives, and pain relievers. So over-the-counter medications are often helpful to patients with inflammatory bowel disease as symptoms arise. And the so choice of the symptom is individualized to, to the choice of the agent is individualized to the symptom that predominates in each patient. So uh, for diarrhea, for example, we might use loperamide or emodium and bismuth or peptobismol as needed. For fever or joint pain, we might consider acetaminophen over a medication like ibuprofen, aspirin, naproxen, which can cause flares of disease. The, it should be noted that these agents represent supportive care only, don't address the disease activity. 
And it's also important that the use of over-the-counter products be discussed with the physician before taking the medication, particularly if the patient is already being treated with other prescription agents for inflammatory bowel movements. An important note to be made here, while narcotic pain medications are typically prescription medications and not over-the-counter, they should be avoided as much as possible as they're associated with worse outcomes in patients with inflammatory bowel movements. So moving on from over-the-counter uh, medications, then there are prescription medications. And let's delve a little bit more into these medications. My goal here is just to highlight the different classes of medications, but not necessarily delve into specific agents. That's a better discussion for the patient with this provider. So antibiotics. Antibiotics can help control symptoms of inflammatory bowel disease by reducing intestinal bacteria and by directly suppressing the intestine's immune system. Although some feel that the data are limited, other believe that antibiotics are effective as long-term therapy in some patients with inflammatory bowel disease, particularly patients with Crohn's disease who have fistulas, those abnormal connections that we discussed or abscesses. Antibiotics can also be effective in treating pouchitis, post-surgical ulcerative colitis. And patients whose active disease is successfully treated with antibiotics may be kept on these as maintenance therapy as long as the medication remains effective. Although helpful in some patients with ulcerative with Crohn's disease, antibiotics are generally not considered helpful in ulcerative colitis for either inducing or maintaining remission. There are amino salicylates, and these are also known as ASA or 5 ASA agents. They interfere with the body's ability to control inflammation. And they, there's different formulations of them to target inflammation in different areas, and they're most effective in treating mild to moderate ulcerative colitis, perhaps less effective in Crohn's disease. They're generally well tolerated with very few side effects. We've already touched base on corticosteroids. So corticosteroids are fast-acting anti-inflammatory drugs. You can get them orally, rectally, IV. They've really been the mainstay of treatment for acute flares of disease for years. And they're initially effective in inducing remission, pretty good at it in all sort of colitis and Crohn's, but they are not recommended for long-term use due to many undesirable side effects that include infection, bone loss, weight gain, cataracts, fragility of the skin, sleep issues, and mood swings. For these reasons, corticosteroids are generally given in the lowest possible dosage for the shortest amount of time and are not used for maintenance. There are immunomodulators, which have been used in the treatment of IBD since the 1970s. These agents do weaken or modulate the activity of the immune system, but then results in a decrease in inflammation. They are steroid sparing agents used in maintenance, and they help you come off of steroids. They're better taken along with other medications to get patients into remission. A lot of patients have heard of biologic therapies. Biologic therapies represent a newer class of drugs these are genetically engineered medications that are made from living organisms and their products, such as proteins or antibodies, um, help in the treatment of IBD. They interfere with the body's inflammatory response by targeting specific enzymes, proteins, molecules that scientists believe may play a role in the IBD process. There are also biosimilars, which are available as biologic medications similar to their originator and approved Switching one time from the originator to the biosimilar has been studied and is found to be safe. So these are other biologic therapies that can be used. Finally, there are small molecules like the JAK inhibitors. These molecules are broken down in the GI tract after ingestion and are directly absorbed into the bloodstream through the intestine. These are oral medications that have a fast onset of action and do a good job also maintaining remission. So lots of prescription medication options. And again, it's a very personalized decision that needs to be discussed with your gastroenterologist in terms of decision. It's very easy to focus on the medical therapies, but surgery is also uh, oftentimes used as a, as a way to treat inflammatory bowel disease. The decision to have surgery to help manage a patient's inflammatory bowel disease should be when possible, well thought out in order for the patient and the family to understand all the surgical options. And the goal of surgery is to provide a better quality of life to alleviate symptoms and disease complications, preserve as much of the bowel as possible, and to improve quality of life. There's a nice couple of uh, links there for you for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis on surgery and its role in management. And I hope you get a chance to review that. That's some very good information there. All right, well, that wraps up IBD management and treatment. Now we can move on to a special population, the pregnant patient. So understanding IBD in pregnant women is important. Um, there are some special considerations. 
So women should be well before becoming pregnant. It is generally not a good idea to begin a pregnancy when the disease is flaring, when the woman has recently begun a new treatment, or when she is on steroid medications. Most problems occur in women with active disease, when a disease-related inflammation created proteins that result in miscarriage, premature delivery, or stillbirth. If a woman is already pregnant, she should continue on the regimen that has kept her well, even if it includes steroids, although doctors will try to minimize this. Most medications, with the medication, with the exception perhaps of methotrexate or tocilumab, appear safe when used at the lowest effective dose during pregnancy. And so pregnant women should discontinue use of methotrexate and tocilumab, and your doctor will guide you to that, but should otherwise continue therapy. All pregnant women, including those with inflammatory bowel disease, should eat a well-balanced diet and um, uh, also remain on any vitamins that, were, uh, that they were on prior to becoming pregnant. These include folic acid, uh, which is particularly important uh, when taking sulfasalazine, but in addition, it's also necessary during pregnancy. In some cases, IBD actually improves during pregnancy. That's because in all pregnancies, the body suppresses the immune system to prevent it from rejecting the fetus. And in women with IBD, this phenomenon often serves to put the disease in remission. And in one study in Crohn's disease suggests that pregnancy may also protect against future flares, and may reduce the need for surgery. There's good, good information on the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website on pregnancy as well. I encourage you to review that information. All right, so I think we can sh shift gears now to the role of diet, nutrition, and complementary therapies. So nutritional deficits uh, do occur in patients with inflammatory bowel disease for several reasons. Small bowel inflammation as occurs in Crohn's disease may prevent the absorption of nutrients causing excessive loss of sugar, fat, protein, minerals, vitamins, and the inflamed intestine may lead to leakage of protein and fluid into the gut. In ulcerative colitis and perhaps in Crohn's colitis where the large bowel is inflamed, only the colon is inflamed. And so the small intestine continues to work normally, but the inflamed colon doesn't recycle water properly. And so you can get diarrhea that results in dehydration and electrolyte deficits. Compounding all this is that patients oftentimes do not eat adequately because eating provokes symptoms such as diarrhea and cramps. And eating, it's, it should be important to note that eating particular foods does not cause or contribute to ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. But once the disease is developed, Paying attention to diet may help reduce symptoms, replace lost nutrients, promote healing. So that's the role of diet and nutrition in managing inflammatory bowel disease. There are some signs to be on the lookout for for malnutrition. And of course, a good physician, gastroenterologist would be on the lookout for these. But even mild cases of malnutrition can make it more difficult for the body to bounce back after an illness. And signs of malnourishment include under eating and are severely restricting the variety and types of the foods that are eaten weight loss, general fatigue and low energy, weakness, loss of muscle mass, and vitamin and mineral deficiency. So how does a patient with inflammatory bowel disease maintain healthy nutrition? A food journal is important here. Creating a food journal may be helpful for patients to identify and subsequently eliminate problematic foods. For patients with IBD, many factors may affect food tolerances, such as the current disease state, portion of the GI tract that's affected. And the key for patients is to strive to establish a well-balanced, healthy diet. Making good food choices includes staying hydrated, drinking enough fluids, eating nutrient-rich foods, aiming for small but frequent meals, four to six small meals a day, and sticking to simple cooking techniques, broiling, grilling, steaming, poaching, minimizing additives. You should talk to your gastroenterologist and deficient, uh, deficiencies in nutrition can be addressed to help you develop a personalized meal plan. Let's, let's finally finish off with talking a bit about complementary medicine. The complementary medicine is a non-mainstream practice that is used together with conventional therapy to bring about benefit. And the benefits can include easing pain, helping control symptoms, contributing to a better quality of life, and improving mood and general attitude towards health and well being. And common therapies that require more research but are promising include mind and body therapies, relaxation, mindfulness, hypnosis, acupuncture, yoga, exercise.
there are bi probiotics that may be helpful here. Probiotics are used to restore the balance of the good bacteria in the body. And they're generally safe with a few potential side effects such as gas or bloating. And there, there are food choice, food sources of probiotics, yogurt, kefir, miso, tempeh. But there are also dietary supplements and capsules, tablets, powders. Studies in probiotics are limited. But in ulcerative colitis, there may be some benefit. In Crohn's disease, the studies are more limited. And in pouch disease, in post-surgical ulcerative colitis, it may be helpful. It's always a good idea to talk to your provider before starting any probiotic therapy. What about vitamins and minerals? We've already talked some about that some, but if you do have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, vitamin and mineral supplementation may be recommended, especially if you're at risk for specific nutritional deficiencies. Deficiencies can be caused by medications, surgeries, active inflammation, and IBD, and it can affect your body's ability to absorb certain vitamins and minerals. There are some supplements currently under investigation that may provide some benefit. They include omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, and turmeric. So some things to keep in mind. Let's spend a little bit of time talking about medical cannabis. I do get this question from patients from time to time. In small studies, smoking cannabis, marijuana, which is the dried part of the cannabis plant, has improved IBD symptoms, including pain, nausea, and and decreased appetite. But there's currently no significant evidence that suggests that medical cannabis can reduce inflammation or improve disease activity. And we need more research uh, to discuss, to evaluate the impact of cannabis. So I think that the key with these complementary therapies is that research is underway to study their benefits. They're not FDA regulated. So it's really important to seek out good data to minimize potential risk. And this should complement, not replace the traditional therapies that we've discussed over the previous few slides. As always, I would recommend that patients talk to their doctor before trying any complementary therapies. I think the theme that I've tried to strive for today is that living well with inflammatory bowel disease is the global message from me, from the Crohn's and Colitis Foundations. Patients need to be empowered, empowered take the charge of their illness, reach out for support from the foundation. Compliance with medications is gonna be important here. And an active role from patients includes being compliant with medications, understanding your disease and possible complications, scheduling follow-up appointments, maintaining a well-balanced diet, establishing a support system. And this, the, the disease is unpredictable, sometimes out of control, out of the patient's control, but despite your best efforts. But patients with IBD must develop these emotional coping skills in a positive outlook to maintain good control of their disease. I'll spend a few minutes just going over some good foundation resources, which I certainly use and have recommended to my patients through the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. If you're looking for helpful information, I recommend the, the general Crohn's and Colitis Foundation website uh, listed there. Uh, great webinars on my IBD learning, including this webinar and others. You can find your local chapter uh, and one-on-one -on -one peer support through the Power of Two program through the websites that are listed. You can also find ways to connect with others, whether through a local support group, a community website, the Facebook group, and those are the links for you to utilize uh, in those circumstances. I also want to point out the IBD Help Center, which has trained specialists available to provide information, guidance, and support brochures, and there are 170 different languages in which this support is undertaken. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, to our webinar today. I hope you enjoyed this talk and I look forward to seeing you again on a different